they just go crazy, you know, and I just say that's unacceptable yeah. here. Other than that, you know, unless we're really, really pressed, you know, I will wait a couple more minutes and then we'll start. As much you can do, yeah. I'm amazed that you know that they didn't figure it out when putting it up. So I remember the first time I spoke in this room, I decided to throw my notes away. I can't see a thing. You know. I can't even imagine what it would be like to do some of this research again. And the yeah, no, we should now. Explain them all of their economic interests. I don't think. I actually did my surveys. These got started because I was over in Moscow. I had done a slew of interviews all around Poland. Yeah, 100 plus bureaucrats I met with. They were all open the doors, mm -hmm. very helpful and nice, tolerated my poor Polish. Are you a Polish too? Yeah, oh, I really had studied for it, and, um, and then, um, I couldn't get much access. Yeah. And one of my yeah. advisors yeah. said, "Why don't you do surveys?" And Good idea. All right. You ready to get started? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yes. Hello? Oh, good, it's working. <laughs> Sorry. Madison, is there anything that can be done with these lights, do you know, right here? They're blinding. Yeah, I know, but we're not, we're not in East Germany, Wayne, you know. I know, but we're not in East Germany, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. Wow, it's amazing. There we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, it needs more than good lights for that. That's for dog, I'm sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am not um, Matt Rojansky, but my name is uh, Ken Yellowitz. Uh, Matt is here, but running very, very busily today, so I'm subbing for him uh, both to chair this session and also as discussant. Um, just to introduce myself for a quick second, uh, I am a global fellow here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, a former diplomat, uh, ambassador to Belarus and Georgia, and also spent nine years at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire as the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And before um, introducing formally our speaker today, Dr. Mark Berenson, uh, I do want to uh, inform you about a program uh, which will be next Tuesday, July 22nd, and the title is uh, The Impact of Ukraine in the Neighborhood, and it's basically uh, to look at the impact of the Ukrainian crisis in Ukraine, but also in the countries of the South Caucasus, uh, Moldova, uh, and Belarus. And the panelists are John Herbst, uh, former ambassador to Ukraine, now at the Atlantic Council, uh, Eric Rubin, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, uh, Tom Deval, a Senior Associate for Russia and Eurasia Program at the Carnegie Endowment, and uh, me again. I will chair the panel, but also have a few words to say uh, about Belarus. So if you're interested in attending, um, it's on the um, Wilson Center and Kennan Institute's uh, website, and please, you know, please uh, sign up for it. Today's subject is a, a fascinating one, I must admit. Um, I've had a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Behrens and Mark a few times about his research, and I must admit uh, it's a very, very interesting subject. Um, uh, for those of us, you know, who were involved with the collapse of the Soviet Union and trying to build, um, uh, you know, civil society and the rule of law in countries of the former Soviet Union, uh, this question of payment of taxes and what that reflects uh, on a country uh, in terms of its identity and the 
uh, the engagement of citizens, uh, you know, with their government and in the future of the country. The tech's uh, role is a very, very important one and not one that I've seen studied very often. So I'm really uh, delighted that um, uh, Mark is doing this research and he's going to be able to share uh, his results with us. Uh, Mark is a Title VIII research scholar at the Kennan Institute. Uh, he is presently senior lecturer at King's College London in the Russian Institute. Uh, he's also a research fellow on the governance team at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex in Brighton. Uh, his manuscript, his book manuscript, um, from which you know his talk today uh, is based, um, the title is Taxes and Trusts Transitioning from Coercion to Compliance uh, in Poland, Russia, and Ukraine uh, is currently in preparation, and articles uh, based on the book have appeared in Comparative Political Studies, uh, the Journal of Communist Studies, and Transition Politics, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, he has also been a research analyst for the American Bar Association, the East-West Institute, uh, the Carter Center, and the Strengthening Democratic Institution Project at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Uh, in addition, Mark founded and directed the Law in Action Program for Freedom House in Kyiv, Ukraine. And in terms of his educational background, BA from Harvard and a PhD in political science from Princeton University. Mark, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really grateful that Ken to uh, step up to the plate and uh, uh, hit me with some good comments um, this afternoon on, on this presentation. I'm also really grateful uh, to you all for being here on probably the nicest day we've had um, weather-wise, uh, at least since I've been in Washington this summer. And I'm grateful to the Kennedy Institute and Title VIII program for the opportunity to be here um, this summer. It's been a great one. Um, my presentation today is uh, basically based on um, a chapter towards the end of this draft manuscript that I'm working on um, at the moment. And it's focused more on uh, public opinion, but I also am going to present sort of my main arguments as well as I go through uh, the entire book. And my overall research question that I'm asking in this, in this book, uh, Taxes and Trust, Transitioning from Co coercion to compliance in Poland, Russia, and Ukraine, is why are some transitional states more effective in implementing tax policy to raise revenue than others? It's motivated of a question of trying to look at how well the state functions at doing what states do. And one of the main tasks of states is to collect taxes to draw revenue from society. And they need a bureaucracy and a willing society in order to do that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, kind of come up with this model for what uh, explains state capacity uh, for the post-communist states. And I envision um, a state that's bureaucratically rational, that is, it approaches society through historical reference points that are geared towards times in which the state is viewed to be capable and legitimate in the eyes of both state and society, and embodies a structure, resources, and work philosophy that are all oriented outwards towards society. And it interacts with society through trust, and it's a society that has qualities facilitating cooperative behavior, such as satisfaction with the transition, economic well-being, strong nationalism, long-term trust of the state. And by interacting with, through trust, um, state society are enabled the state to uh, implement policy. Um, and I'm testing this model with respect to uh, tax compliance. And I view good tax compliance as requiring rational tax bureaucracies that have these healthy historical reference points, um, structures, resources, and work philosophies that are all citizen focused and focused on gaining trust um, in the citizens with respect to taxes. And having a compliance society that's willing to partner with the state and approaches the state um, out of trust and not so much out of fear. And there's a couple of different, there's actually a lot of ways to look at tax compliance. Um, a common way is to look at um, taxes as a percentage of GDP. How much is collected as a percentage of GDP? Um, and while that's useful, I find that that also implies upon what is the state's plan or mission 
because different states may not want to collect as much taxes or have the same type or size of states to, with which to um, collect taxes from. But they do make plans each year, and they also um, expect uh, to gain a certain amount of their revenue in terms of taxes. At the end of each year, they calculate the amount of arrears that are owed to them. And for the period from 1995 to 2011, Poland averaged about 8% of end-of-the-year tax arrears as a percentage of their annual tax receipts. For the same period, in Russia, the figure is about 21%. And the data for Ukraine, which I have presented up here for 96 to 2001, was almost 26%. And just as a comparison, um, the U.S. for a three-year period, the average is about 3.8%. So you see that Poland, um, right from the beginning of the transition, was actually able to collect taxes in line um, with compliance rates that were much more similar to that of uh, U.S. and Western countries. And I've also done, which will be the focus of uh, much of today's talk, um, surveys of the general public regarding their attitudes towards paying taxes, their attitudes towards the state, um, and their willingness to comply with the state's actions. And I asked um, in 2004 in Poland and Russia, 2005 in Ukraine, and in 2010 in all three countries, um, a series of questions. And I asked this one question here, would you follow the tax laws even if you do not consider them to be fair? Uh, trying to get, you can't ask people, do you follow the tax laws? Do you pay your taxes? And expect to get an honest answer unless perhaps you're surveying in a um, place called, like Finland or elsewhere in Scandinavia. But you can ask questions such as, um, what would you do if you didn't like the tax laws, if you thought they were to be unfair? And in Poland in 2004, about 83 percent of the population surveyed said that they would comply. Uh, that figure was a, dropped a little bit to 77 percent in 2010. In Russia in 2004, it was 53 percent, very similar uh, six years later. In Ukraine, one year after the Orange Revolution took place, in November of 2005, I surveyed the public and found that only 36 percent of the population um, agreed that they would obey an unfair tax law. And that figure was somewhat similar and held up as being robust in 2010 survey. And just for kicks, this is sort of a different um, uh, analysis than what the data I have at the bottom of the screen. But the EU, Canada's Re Revenue Agency, as well as the IRS, all estimate um, tax compliance in those countries and, and in the EU to be roughly between 89 to 85 percent, um, I'm sorry, but 85 to 93 percent um, in Canada uh, with, with respect to tax compliance. Um, so Poland, uh, more earlier on uh, and, and more robustly, is uh, in line with um, general attitudes towards paying taxes that we might see in uh, Western countries. Now, what makes for a bureaucratic, <coughs> rational tax state? I'm going to go through a little bit um, uh, some of the arguments I, I'm writing up in my, my book. Where to find bureaucratic rationalism within a state? What I do is I look under the bonnet, if you were in the UK, or the hood um, of the state itself and look inside the state's bureaucracies to s look at their historical reference points, their structures, their resources, and their work philosophy within the tax administrations to see how well they are oriented towards society. Um, with respect to Poland, Russia, and Ukraine, historical references are used quite differently in the bureaucracies. Poland. Um, already in the 90s, began calling back some of the interwar barbarian structures that were part of their bureaucracies and carried forth some of the legislation that was uh, adopted in the earlier Polish Republic between the two world wars with respect to its civil service, to drafting a supreme audit chamber, to its chief administrative uh, court. Even some of their tax uh, structures and organs uh, were modeled on what they had in the interwar period. Um, Russia, meanwhile, towards the end of the 90s, began to reject sort of the glasnost model of how to um, call for uh, a, a check on the state. Uh, in many ways, glasnost was trying to open up society, open up the state, such that society would be more capable of providing for a check on state activities. 
Um, it was perhaps one of the more liberalizing moments in Russian history. Um, but already by the end of the 90s, that model, as Putin came into office, was being rejected. There's a lack of a civil service tradition in the Soviet Union, whereas um, Poland carried, was the only uh, actual country in the Eastern Bloc that had a civil service system um, adopted in 1982. And that was brought forth from uh, earlier periods in time. Uh, Russia also uh, began to hire within their tax structures uh, military and law enforcement personnel, especially under Putin, in order to rebuild a strong hierarchical control. And meanwhile, in Ukraine, you find the tax structures and tax administrations that tried to emulate Russia in many ways, um, but were a weaker tool. The state tax administration chief, Mikhail Azarov, created the tax system in around 1996 with both political as well as fiscal um, purposes in mind. Under Kuchma, the VAT uh, tax be and schemes began to use to fund political campaigns, and it was considered to be a weakly political weapon even in the 2004 elections. So I, pr I view and assess these by looking underneath the tax structures that the historical reference points that are used are more citizen-based within Poland, recalling for Poles a time when the state was of, by, and for Poles, whereas in Russia and uh, countries in the former Soviet Union, uh, coercive to a greater or lesser extent. With respect to structural design, um, the Poland has design aspects within its tax uh, administration that are rational in terms of dividing and subordinating functions and began to uh, provide constraints that would cr constrain uh, construction. It also has a supreme audit chamber which actually does function like a real watchdog organization, um, providing for outside reports um, directly to the parliament, not to the Ministry of Finance or to the tax administration as to how the tax administration is functioning. Russia. Um, had a poor design and lacked barriers to corruption throughout the 90s, but was improving somewhat. But its accounts chamber, or outside sort of audit chambers, um, is far less transparent, um, as I can sort of assess my own personal experience in trying to get um, explanations as to how they're, they're operating. Um, within Ukraine, uh, the Azarov created this system that was sort of strict control, Zosovsky uh, control, which contributed to less fear of the state than in Russia. Local tax offices were given more autonomy, especially with respect to uh, smaller and medium-sized businesses. But there was also less oversight um, provided by the government, by the parliament, or by an accounting chamber. With respect to human resources, um, Poland has uh, and had inherited a real civil service uh, system with personnel that were hired in competition even from the late 1990s uh, onwards with respect to the tax administration. Uh, tax inspectors were viewed to have high levels of uh, education and they had also extensive training and planning for rolling out the new taxes. Poland, Russia, and Ukraine all introduced the main uh, taxes for the tax system in the early 1990s, roughly in the 92 to 94 period. Um, Poland, in preparing for this, went all out with a full media campaign, getting tax administrative officials uh, who had been trained for six months well before the uh, rollout of the new tax system was to take place, to then go on television, go on radio to form information booths within the tax offices, such that um, by the late 1990s, uh, one survey within Poland touted the tax office as the third most trusted um, uh, or, uh, institution within Polish society, within the Polish state, rather. Um, Russia, on, on the other hand, um, has a military law personnel, um, this sort of uh, uh, the cadre within the tax um, administration. Um, even into the 2000s, these were not hired by competitions. Complaints about how high a level of education they had, and there's also poor and moderate training with prior to rolling out the new taxes. Um, Ukraine also had uh, personnel problems. Um, few uh, tax officials were regarded as understanding the laws that well. And the other fascinating thing was even um, as recently as several years back, um, within Kiev itself, firms would choose to locate in different parts of town in order to be in, under the tax office domain 
of a tax office where they were viewed to have good quality tax officials because they varied dramatically from one tax office to the other. Um, and the bottom line is the work philosophy of the tax administrations differs dramatically uh, with respect to Poland, Russia, and Ukraine. In Poland, it's much more compliance driven, treating taxpayers more like uh, citizens and clients. In Russia, it's more target driven, trying to go after those, for example, who might have already paid because they're known to have money for when the target uh, requires the tax inspectors or the tax office to reach a certain goal in collecting. Um, Ukraine also had target-driven uh, uh, collections even after the Orange Revolution that was supposed to dramatically overhaul the way in which the state was relating to society. Um, but there was great uh, bureaucratic uh, discretion, and it did have a ta it has had a tax police that is less coercive than that that we sort of imagine or know about within the Russian Federation itself. So what makes for tax-compliant society as it interacts with such different states. How do Poles, Russians, and Ukrainians differ in their willingness to pay taxes? And secondly, um, after d d answering that question, I'll look at why Poles, Russians, and Ukrainians do differ, and what has changed um, over the, for Poles, Russians, and Ukrainians uh, in their interactions over the past five to six years, and how much do Poles, Russians, and Ukrainians actually trust their state? Um, so I showed you this question earlier, um, where roughly uh, in 2004-05, 83 percent of Poles said they would agree to obey an unfair tax law, 53 percent of Russians said they would agree, and 36 percent of Ukrainians um, in 2005 said they would agree. Um, I also asked this question, should a citizen always follow the tax laws? Not you yourself, but should a citizen always follow the tax laws, even if he or she considers them to be unfair? And if you notice, the figures for, for Poland in 2004 and 2010 are roughly similar to what they w were for asking of individuals themselves. But the figures for Russia and for Ukraine, they're about 20 points higher when they're asked whether citizens should do so than whether individuals should do so, they themselves. Um, showing that there's a real disconnect in the minds of the respondents to these questions as to what people should do as opposed to what a citizen should do, what, what they themselves should do. Um, I also ask this question, do you think the tax laws are fair? Um, and I ask this question in a different part of the survey rather than right up against the question of do you, would you follow the tax laws if you thought they were unfair? But what we found was the person, those who answered no for both, who thought the tax laws were both unfair and said they would not follow unfair tax laws. In Poland, that was about 12% of the survey population. In Russia, that was about 21%, which is obviously higher, who answered no to both questions. And then for Ukraine, it was 37%. This is implying that so it suggests that 12 percent of Poles in 2010 did not have any intentions to follow their country's tax laws because they thought they were unfair. That figure was 21 percent of those who thought they shouldn't, uh, didn't have an intention to comply. And then in Ukraine, it suggests that 37 percent of Ukrainians uh, had no intentions of complying with the tax laws. Now, why is there this drastic difference between the three states? Um, and many of us perhaps might be sort of uh, not that surprised if Poland differs from the former Soviet Union states, but why is Russia and Ukraine so different from each other with respect to willingness to pay taxes? Um, what I try to do and e explain is, is I undertake um, regressional analysis uh, with respect to three different approaches states take when trying to increase individual level tax uh, compliance. Um, this, all states everywhere, whether the US, the UK, former Soviet Union, they all try to encourage um, uh, states to, uh, and citizens to um, comply with paying taxes through these three different methods to some extent. The first is coercion, that is deterring taxpayers into complying out of fear of punishment. 
The second is gaining citizen trust and comp confidence so that taxpayers will comply quasi-voluntarily. And the third is improving customer service by emphasizing procedural fairness as the taxpayers interact with the tax officers. Um, as I said, all states do a combination of these different approaches. Some vary more towards coercion than others. Um, so this is the question that you've seen um, that I use as my so-called dependent variable that I'm trying to explain. What accounts for the variation up here with respect to why some said they would and, and others said they wouldn't obey unfair tax laws? And I asked a lot of other questions in my survey to get it um, to be used as independent variables to try and um, serve as proxy variables for these three main approaches. I asked this question with respect to the deterrence or coercion uh, theory and approach. Um, would you obey, would you, uh, is it possible that you would evade paying taxes if you knew you could get away with it? And the notion here is trying to measure how strong, to whether uh, uh, coercion has an effect or not, and then putting it into this regression equation to try and figure out what is the impact of being vulnerable to coercion have upon one's decision in a more realistic situation to obey or not obey an a tax law one deemed to be unfair. I also ask questions about trust to, to uh, several different questions regarding trust as proxy variables for quasi-voluntary compliance, trust in the president, trust in the prime minister, and trust parliament and the government in these countries. For some regressions, I also played around with um, including sort of a trust scale, combining this together with two additional questions, such as, do you trust the state to do what is right, and do you trust the state to fulfill its duties? I also asked, do you regard there to be many or few honest tax bureaucrats? Um, and, how, and because this notion of quasi-voluntary compliance, um, which Margaret Levy uh, uh, is, is sort of renowned for, for putting down on paper, uh, implies that not only would you pay taxes out of a trust for the state to provide you with goods and services in return, but you'd also pay taxes if you trusted other people in society to pay taxes as well, because nobody wants to be the only person paying money to the state. Um, and so I asked about perceptions that others were evading or paying taxes. And I also asked questions regarding uh, one's previous contact with the tax bureaucracy. In addition to all those, there's a series of sort of control variables I asked about. Um, income, the, all of these control variables about other theories based upon um, mostly U.S. studies of, of tax compliance. That the the theories that the wealthier you are, the more likely you would pay taxes, or perhaps not. <laughs> um, there's also the, th I also asked this question, um, whether ta people filed their income taxes themselves, because particularly in Russia and Ukraine during this time, uh, the Ukraine this month has, has changed their personal income tax rules. Um, Russia and Ukraine have, a, have had um, a flat tax. Russia since 2001 and Ukraine from 2003 and up until uh, the end of June of this year um, had a flat tax. And uh, that enabled the state to basically just uh, get taxes paid by the employers, such that if you were employed by um, just one uh, employer, you didn't need to file taxes yourself because the employer could do it for you. You earn money from more than one source, however, you would have to file taxes. Um, but I wanted to see whether that made a difference, um, how you filed. Uh, education levels, sometimes some say the smarter you are or the, the more educated you are, um, uh, the more likely you would be to comply with the state. Believe it or not, um, being male in a lot of theories shows that you're less likely to pay taxes. Um, and so I asked questions about that and age and one's willingness to be part of the political process by asking them about whether they voted in recent elections or would be likely to vote in upcoming elections. Um, and so this is sort of the uh, results, um, so to speak, um, for this six different surveys, if you will, for Poland, um, Russia, and Ukraine in 2004 and five, and for Poland, Russia, and Ukraine in 2010. What I've done is I'm showing for the three main theories of coercion, quasi-voluntary compliance, which relies upon trust 
um, in society and in the state, and also previous contact with uh, um, tax bureaucrats. Um, if they were significant within the regression, if they came up as being strong, um, we prominent. I then undertook a next step of trying to figure out what is the effect of these individual variables upon the likelihood that you would obey an unfair tax law. So, for example, within the Polis survey of 2004, in which you had very high number of 83 percent of the population stating that they would, in the survey, obey an unfair tax law, and only 6 percent in that survey said that they would not obey. The one variable that was significant was, was this trust in government. And that implies, after doing additional step of analysis, by holding all of the other all the other independent variables even at their means and varying this one variable from its lowest amount of zero trust in government to full trust in government, one is eight percent more likely to obey an unfair tax law if one trusted. So the notion that trust in government is the strongest variable for, for polls in determining uh, uh, their likelihood of obeying an unfair tax law in 2004. In Russia, what one finds is withdrawing that deterrence, if you take away the deterrent threat, it made people 22 percent less likely to state that they would obey an unfair tax law. Meanwhile, if one were to trust, said they trusted Putin to the fullest extent, meant that one would be 14 percent more likely to obey an unfair tax law. Distrusting tax bureaucrats, if you, found, if you viewed that there was a lot of bureaucrats out there in the tax system who were dishonest and distrustful, um, that decreased your willingness by about 15 percent. And if you had contact with the tax bureaucrats in the past, um, recently, in the past three years, I asked, um, of which about 25 percent of Russians said that they had such contact. Um, in the recent past, and made them 4 percent more likely to obey. Um, so here we find that Rush, Poles reacted more out of trust. Russians, the strongest deterrent was, uh, strongest variable was the coercive uh, effect, uh, with some trust variables mattering. And with Ukraine, what we find is withdrawing that deterrent threat, as well as this trust in the tax bureaucrats within the system were about equally matched. So this is why I've sort of titled my talk, um, uh, Citizen Subjects and Slackers, because for Poland, uh, they respond less out of fear and more out of trust, which makes them function with respect to the tax system as citizens, upholding obligations to states. Russians are more fearful and less trustful acting more like subjects that is fulfilling obligations um, towards the state if they're deterred into doing so. And Ukrainians are less fearful of the state, less trusting of the state, and they seek to evade interaction with the state altogether. And they have the lowest levels of support for obeying tax laws. Now, I repeated this in 2010, as I said. For all three surveys in 2010, trust variables seem to matter more the deterrent variable also sh picks up a bit in the Polish survey, um, but there's still a lot of trust variables which had great impact. In, in Russia, you also had um, trust variables mattering, and in Ukraine, trust variables seem to matter an awful lot. Ukrainians are very distrustful of their state, which explains a lot for why uh, they have such low levels of tax compliance for tax compliance. So what's changed um, between 2004 and 2010 um, with respect to these interactions with the tax bureaucrats? Um, I asked a lot of questions about citizens' experience with the tax bureaucrats. What was your impression of the individual contact you had with the tax service employees? Now, again, in Poland, it was about 40 45 percent of the population had contact with the tax bureaucrats. In Russia, it was about 25 percent, and in Ukraine, it was 15 percent. The survey in Ukraine was also much larger. I, had a, I asked the, about 4,000 Ukrainians as to their attitudes on these questions. 
um, 2,000 in Russia was a sample size, and in Poland it was 1,000 to 1,200 in these Polish surveys. But we find that the impression they had is most strongly positive in the Polish case, followed by the Russian case, and then followed by the Ukrainian case. Um, were you satisfied with the results of your meeting with the tax service employees? Um, again, Poles were more satisfied than Russians, who were more satisfied generally than Ukrainians. Were you satisfied by how the tax service employees spoke with and treated with you, how they interacted with you? Again, Poles were more satisfied than Russians, who were more satisfied than Ukrainians. Now, there's also this notion that uh, Tom Tyler in the study of why people obey the law, which is uh, done out of um, looking at Chicago um, uh, 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 court system, um, argues that it isn't just your, the, how you interact with the state matters upon your willingness to obey the state in the future. And how you interact with the state isn't just dependent upon whether you were satisfied with the outcome of having had an interaction with a judge or a police officer, or in this case, a tax inspector or a tax official, but also depends upon how you were um, treated by them as well. And what we find in the Russia case is that when asking this question, were you satisfied with the result of your contact with the tax bureaucrat? And were you satisfied with the conduct? For those who said they were satisfied with both, both here or one or the other, um, it was about 72 to 75 percent likelihood that they, said that they would obey an unfair tax law uh, in the future. If you were dissatisfied with both, both, both how you were treated and the outcome, that likelihood of stating that you would obey an unfair tax law dropped by about 20 points. So clearly, no one likes to walk into a tax office and to be told that they are owed more money than they expected to when they came through the door. But how you're treated in that moment can matter in terms of your willingness to obey the state in the next time around. This, however, didn't show up to be of any significance in the 2010 survey. Um, it didn't show up in the Polish survey of 2004. One could see possibly, because there's this these are in the 80s, and this is 74 percent that it may have showed up a little bit in the Polish 2010 survey. Um, and what's fascinating is there's such low levels of trust and such low levels of willingness to pay in Ukraine. In fact, all of these figures are so low. They are, even for those who are satisfied by both how they were treated and the outcome of their, the result with the meeting with the tax authorities, that's still lower than their willingness to comply if you were looking at the Russian case, um, where people were dissatisfied with both. Um, so how much do they trust their state? Does your state fulfill its obligations to citizens? Um, Poland and Russia is 21 to 24 percent. But in 2005 and again in 2010, only 9 to 10 percent of the public believed that they could trust their state to fulfill its obligations. And again, only 9 to 10 percent of the public in Ukraine felt that they could trust their government to do what is right. Um, clearly, this indicates, and this is across the board, East and West Ukraine, it's um, not limited sort of to certain pockets. Does the state re treat everyone in equal, fair manner? Again, Ukraine has the lowest levels of support for that. Does the state protect you? Ukraine is lower at 28 percent than the figures of 42 and 43 percent for Russia and Poland. Now, are there many dishonest people who work in the tax service? Um, in Poland, the figures for the two surveys were 21 and 23 percent. And Russia in 2004 was 42 percent and 35 percent. In Ukraine, the figures I've surveyed in 2005, 10, and 2012, roughly 52 to 55 percent of the public believes there are many dishonest people who work in the tax system. 
And I also surveyed in Russia uh, the tax officials. I had this unique opportunity to try and get access to what tax officials there think. And while this isn't dramatically high, 14% said there are many who are dishonest people who work in the tax service. When you sort of look at that and the totals who, of those who declined to uh, answer, you find that only four out of five people in the tax system believe that their fellow employees within Russia were honest, which is um, one can make a judgment as to how high or, or low that is. Um, again, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, the tax office in Poland was viewed favorably by half the respondents, um, the highest among public institutions in a 1999 survey. Um, in, and this really was because they went, well, you know, Americans might think, we might think that um, we don't have such high regard for the IRS on an individual level, but the tax system as it was being rolled out in Poland went out of its way to get people to uh, file. Uh, uh, ignoring at the beginning minor mistakes, um, having information checkpoints, and uh, spending time with individual taxpayers and acquainting them with this newfound process of filing on tax, on tax forms. And moreover, the polls by the end of the decade began to recognize that if they filed for taxes, they would get rebates back from the government. And many people would be eligible for receiving such uh, medical insurance or other types of rebates in Russia and elsewhere, but don't bother to file for them. Um, and then Russia's uh, have a uh, businessmen at least give uh, tax pay and tax inspectors a very negative uh, characteristic. Um, there's also a great concern about what others think. In many ways, it's greater than that what, what they're worried about with respect to the state. Is it possible that you would evade taxes if you were sure you could get away with it? Um, these figures up here are higher than could you avoid paying taxes if you were sure that, no, that there would be no punishment but your coworkers, uh, friends and acquaintances would, be, would know about it and, and would not approve, the, the figure drops. So it matters much more for people in these countries as to what their so-called peers see rather than what uh, the t state sees. I also surveyed, as I said, the tax officials in Russia. And 47% agreed that the state fulfills its obligations to citizens. About half trusted their state to do what is right. About half also stated that the state treats, treats citizens equally fair. Um, so for people who work within the system, they're not necessarily viewing the system as being 100% um, trustworthy. Some 23%, with another 7% declining um, to reply, state that if the state does not fulfill its obligations to its citizens, then tax evasion is justified. Um, more than one in five tax officials recognize that if an enterprise were to follow all the demands of the tax organs, then it would be ruined. And about a third of all the tax officials stated that inspectors were unable to catch out all those in society who, were, who, were, who were failed to comply with the state. And finally, um, this figure that I've been sort of showing throughout, um, I also asked it of tax officials themselves. And about um, 22, at least 22 percent uh, stated that they wouldn't follow the, the tax laws um, if they thought they were unfair, which I thought was high for those working within the tax system itself. Um, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> That was a rather abrupt ending, Mark, but thank you very, very much. And that was really very incisive and very, very interesting. Um, I'd like to make a number of comments, um, uh, and then we'll open it up to, uh, to questions. I'd like to begin uh, by asking you, you had a, one line um, in your presentation that uh, attitudes in Ukraine you know, were, were uniform. Uh, that was one question that I had as I read, you know, your, your chapter, you know, was whether or not you can disaggre disaggregate, you know, for Eastern, Western, and particularly uh, Crimea. I think that would be a very interesting uh, point to, uh, you know, to make to see if, if there are any differences. But let me make some, some general comments. Um, the three countries that you chose uh, are very, very interesting. but. 
I think they're also uh, quite different, and I think, you know, I'm not sure in other parts of the book if you're going to go into it, uh, but for Poland, when I read your paper, I went back and asked some colleagues who had served, you know, in Poland uh, in the 80s, and their description of Poland in the 80s was not dissimilar, you know, to Ukraine today. You know, basically it was, you know, cheating the government, and we knew that from, you know, from the Soviet Union, you know, as well. So what changed, you know, what changed in Poland? And I think this is also, you know, one of the important differences, you know, with, you know, certainly with Ukraine and, and obviously Russia. You have, you know, the solidarity, you know, experience. You have a genuine uh, revolution, you know, that took place, you know, that ousted, you know, the old government. And what you really had in Poland was a strong sense of, you know, national identity, you know, that now, you know, the state really and the country really did belong, you know, to the citizenry. And when you add to that a factor that um, Poland is now both an EU member and a NATO member, uh, I would love to see whether or not, you know, or how much uh, you believe, you know, those factors, you know, played into, you know, the transformation, you know, in, in, in Poland. Obviously, there was a lot of EU assistance that went in, American assistance, you know, that, that tried to, you know, to do exactly, you know, helping uh, the, the transition and helping create, you know, the institutions uh, for, you know, for, for civil uh, society. Um, Looking at Ukraine, uh, again, the thing that strikes me with Ukraine, my experience, you know, obviously is mostly in Russia, the former Soviet Union, and Georgia. And to me, there's some very significant parallels, you know, with Georgia. Uh, both Georgia and Ukraine, you know, have precious little experience in sort of the modern era of being an independent state and, you know, with a sense of, you know, developed national unity. Uh, and in Georgia, uh, you know, the situation, if you would have done this type of polling when I was there in the 90s, uh, you probably would have come out exactly, you know, the same. But what changed there? Well, one was, you know, Saakashvili, uh, you know, for all of his warts, you know, he did, you know, change uh, the system there. He did eliminate a lot of corruption. And you know, he used coercion very, very clearly, you know, to get people to pay taxes, particularly large taxpayers. But I think the system, you know, has been internalized. And I think, you know, in part, it's a reflection of, you know, a successful leadership, you know, that uh, improved the quality, you know, of not only leadership, but also of the state institutions. He later went awry, as we know. But I think leadership, you know, is a key factor. Uh, and certainly the lack of that in Ukraine, uh, you know, is, you know, is also, uh, you know, a very, very important uh, part. Um, again, you know, with Ukraine, there's, you know, no EU membership, there's no NATO membership. So that, you know, that factor, you know, is lacking as well, as well as, I think, a weaker national identity. I mean, yesterday you were at the same presentation that I was about, you know, the lack of local control and local empowerment, you know, in Ukraine. And until that happens, it's going to be difficult you, that, you know, the sense was that this national identity is going to have to come, you know, from the ground up, you know, rather than, you know, than the top down. But clearly, uh, it's lacking. And I was wondering, you know, with Ukraine, you know, whether or not you would want to um, hypothesize that, you know, given the struggle, you know, against Russia, given the fact that, uh, you know, that there is a new government now, a popularly elected government, you know, whether you think, you know, if things do by some miracle move in a more positive, you know, direction there, that you're also going to see these attitudes about taxes, you know, change as well uh, as part of this sort of renewed national identity and, and purpose, you know, in, you know, in Ukraine. And finally, about Russia, uh, I'm struck by, you know, the years, you know, that, that, you know, that your research, uh, you know, did, because again, if you probably, you know, would look at the 90s, you know, when, you know, when the, the Diki capitalism and the wild period, you know, under Yeltsin, you know, you probably had, you know, initially, you know, a, a sense of trust in the state, you know, that the Soviet, you know, system was, you know, going to be slowly dismantled and that something new was going to come about. You know, but that changed, and we know that, you know, faith in the central government, the central government weakened Yeltsin's leadership, you know, was, you know, had many, many difficulties to it. And when Putin 
came into power, I think, you know, one of the reasons that he was so popular, you know, was again this reassertion of authority, the reassertion, you know, of the state. And I'm wondering, you know, whether or not, you know, the statistics, you know, the, 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 you know, the surveys that you've done indicate not so much, you know, deterrence and coercion as a negative factor, but as a positive one in the sense that this was now a strong state, you know, and that, uh, that they were willing to pay taxes because it was strong, you know, and it was able, you know, to be a, a little bit more, uh, you, know, uh, you know, coercive in terms of, of delivering services rather than, uh, you know, the, rather than Yeltsin. And also when you talk now about the, uh, the trust factor growing in Russia, you know, I wonder if also, you know, that's a product, you know, obviously there's still a great deal of corruption, you know, in Russia, but at least I, I seem to think that a lot of the, you know, the, the wild raids against business, you know, things that, you know, were really bad, you know, in the 90s and uh, early 2000s seems to have, you know, diminished. The corruption seems to be more, you know, centered in the, you know, in, you know, in the Kremlin itself. And I'm just wondering, you know, whether or not, you know, the, the sort of the different type of corruption that we see now in Russia, you know, has played, uh, you know, into attitudes uh, as well. So those were some, you know, just some general thoughts. But as I said, I think the question, you know, of leadership uh, and the question of sort of a strong national identity and the experience of, of, you know, being an independent country or an independent state, you know, both for Russia and Poland, you know, I think are, are, indiv are very important, whereas Ukraine, I think, you know, lacks that. So if, if you have any reaction to any of that, if it makes any sense, and if not, let's, let's go to questions. Sure. Um, first off, on the sort of national identity, um, Poland in the 1990s was recreating or creating a state of, by, and for Poles. And it was a time um, of extraordinary politics. And what happened, I think, in Russia and Ukraine is sort of politics as usual. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many ways, and, and this is what I get at sort of earlier in the book, is that it does take a transition or, or a revolution, if you will, at times to overcome sort of these uh, great gaps between state society in terms of the society being able to be drawn into state activity to trust the state again and to view it differently than it has before. Um, Poland got that chance. It brought back in, in many ways the institutions from previous times when it was a Polish state in the interwar period. Um, in fact, even some of the communist leaders in the 1980s were trying to bring some of those back right after uh, martial law was uh, declared over as a way of trying to um, legitimize their state. It was only really until when once 89 um, had taken place that some of these institutions could be um, sort of come into their own uh, as they were before. Um, I think that with respect to and, and with respect to national identity and, and revolution and, and overcoming this sort of great gap between state society, which we see and have seen for the last ten plus years in Ukraine, um, and uh, it does take a lot. It does take leadership. It does take those at the um, top to to almost renegotiate the social contract, if you will. Um, with society. Uh, I had hoped, um, I took, you know, I, I had hoped, I started this project before the Orange Revolution, and I hoped the Orange Revolution was going to do that. And a lot of the, the, the um, uh, uh, language was there um, at the time, but wasn't necessarily carried out. And in fact, so there was language, as an example. Um, within the first nine months after the Orange Revolution, tax compliance went way up. Um, and, when, and then when uh, uh, um, uh, um, there was this fallout with Prime Minister Timoshenko between that and, and President Yushchenko um, in roughly September of 2005, um, the levels sort of came back down mm -hmm. to what was normal again as they had been previously. Um, and uh, Ukraine needs sort of to rebuild state society relations in order to do this. And it's re it needs to rebuild trust at all levels of the, of the government. Um, and he asked about um, 
sort of, I do have slides here regarding some regions of Ukraine that I've sort of done some analysis with. That's my next chapter and the one I'm sort of working on at the moment, um, uh, if you bear with me. But in general speaking, what I'm beginning to find within Ukraine, this is looking at 2005 survey, is that, um, uh, sorry, here we go. This is comparing the far west and the far east portion of the country. Mm -hmm. And um, the trust variables matter almost as significantly across the, f the extremes, but they sort of uh, depend upon one's view of who's in power. Mm -hmm. um, there's great distrust all around in some ways. The levels of trust of who trusts the parliament or who trusts the prime minister or who trusts the president vary as depending upon which is in power. And they switched during 2005 to my 2010 survey. So I'm able to sort of show that in the next um, round of this. Um, but uh, with respect to, I guess, finally looking at the EU versus um, the, the influence of the EU. Um, Poland uh, officially um, launched their, uh, made their desire known to join the EU in 1994. Mm -hmm. They applied, they were, had ex uh, negotiations for accession with the EU began in, in 98, and they joined in 2004. Um, the tax system began to be overhauled in the early 90s um, before this. Um, in fact, they also had the same tax system as, I mean, personal income tax, corporate income tax, and value added tax are the three taxes that are used across all three of these countries is sort of the, the, the base with obviously some oil generated um, tax, taxes being important for Russia as well. Um, what state would not have wanted to get their tax system in order as they're embarking upon their route towards a market economy? Poland made the choice to go west because it was making the choice towards a market economy and they were trying to get that right first and, and democracy and a market economy first. Um, the advisors that came from the EU, from U.S. Treasury and the World Bank and certain IMF stipulated Just was, sex. yeah. <laughs> they went to Russia and Ukraine and have been, in, those advisors, if not the, maybe not the same ones, but those organizations have been involved in the track system uh, transitions in Russia and Ukraine as well. I think it's important, um, to, but I also think it's a reflection of um, the importance is probably more about national identity in terms of where they want the country to go. Uh, Ukraine has, the one thing that Ukraine succeeded in is, um, well, up until this year, one could argue, was viewing itself as an independent state. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but these other questions, the country has yet to decide with respect to national identity, and that's what's hurting its back. Good, Good. let's open it to questions. And is that Matt in the back? Please, Matt. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Really interesting. Two two points I wonder if you looked at specifically in Ukraine. There's an extent to which they might apply well in Russia. I would think not at all in Poland. Uh, one is the question of just the proportion of the economy that exists in the gray space mm -hmm. where frameworks, legislative frameworks, just aren't relevant because everything you're doing is hidden. Uh, and, I, and I would think, therefore, that asking questions about whether you'd pay taxes or not sort of beside the point, and I don't know, I, I just wonder if you accommodated that some in, in some way in terms of how you, um, I guess what I mean is um, the answer would be no to all of the above, right? Do you pay taxes? You know, do you have a relationship whatsoever with the state, et cetera? It's sort of like what I do, I do on my own, and, 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 and no one has anything to do with it. Thing. And, and I know in Ukraine, I don't remember the exact number, but it's, a, it's an absurdly large proportion of the economy that's great. The, the second issue is um, the degree to which the distrust in authorities factors that you got into, whether it's tax authorities or high-level political authorities, um, might have been very personal or potentially personal in the Ukrainian context, because I do work on, on corporate rating in Ukraine. and. Um, have found that actually it's it's not a large proportion of of companies across the country. It's it's something like less than one percent. But the perception that a local official might actually be after your stuff. So it's not just that you don't trust them 
they're bad guys, and so you wouldn't want to pay taxes to them because the taxes might not end up in the right place. It's that, in fact, any interaction with those guys might result, for example, if you revealed to them how much money you make, might result in them taking all the rest of your money. Again, very real in Ukraine. Sure. Thanks a lot. Um, these are questions I think I got at more in terms of my personal, oh, let me say personal interviews, but uh, uh, interviews um, with uh, people, uh, tax accountants and people outside the system um, uh, uh, per se, um, uh, outside the tax system, but work with businesses and so forth about the perceptions of um, all this. You're absolutely right that the gray economy is probably much greater in Ukraine um, than in Russia. It was viewed by tax accountants that uh, the m amount of salaries paid under the table in envelopes, cash envelopes, was much greater in Ukraine than in, in Russia. Um, uh, in addition, there is, there's a, there has been a sort of a, a desire, if not almost a game to play in trying to cheating out the tax system uh, greater in Ukraine. Um, and for example, I, I met with one accountant who was turning in his $80,000 BMW. He's a Western accountant, lawyer living in, in, in Ukraine, and was getting another nice car. And um, as a graduate student, that was sort of, you know. Um, but uh, the, rather than um, take ownership of the vehicle, the car dealer pulled out a piece of paper and had a power of attorney document in which basically it said that he had the right, sort of the power of, over, the, over the vehicle but didn't have actual ownership of it. And um, this was to avoid a $200 fine and, and a $200 tax. And the, the idea being that you would go all the way out of your way and not owning a outright an $80,000 car because you just didn't want to pay the $200 fine uh, would be amazing to, to many of us in the room. Um, from a, but for there, it was about trying to uh, uh, keep things, um, you know, out of the hands of the state and play sort of, you know, I'm not getting anything from the state. Why should I try and give even a kopeck to the state if I don't have to? Um, with respect to um, distrust of authorities, um, personal, um, I'm trying to think of an, an example, but y yes, that's there. The system is much more um, depersonalized in Poland um, than it is in Russia, than it is in Ukraine, with respect to how people pay their taxes. Um, I certainly didn't ask people, I mean, I didn't ask people do you, in, in these surveys, the reason why, uh, do you pay your taxes, what type of, uh, uh, what are the sources of your income, and, and all of these things, I, even in Poland, and the questions were worded in such a way, um, with the help of some really uh, talented pollsters in the region, um, to not, to be neutral with respect to including in or excluding out the possibility of, uh, of, of um, greater corruption um, taking part in the process. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. Yes, sir. And please identify yourself. Uh, hello, my name is Yuri Yakushak, I'm at this consulting. I used to work at the IMF on, all, on some of those countries at that time, and I, I'm kind of surprised that you started that the collection rates to GDP don't matter because you started your survey in Ukraine, for example, in 2005. In the course of 2005, Ukrainians collected 5% of GDP more than in 2004. In Georgia, they collected 6% of GDP more in 2004 than in 2003, before their revolution. And in both cases, it was not only positive, of course, in Ukraine, they killed economic growth. In Georgia, they also did a little bit of damage. You don't take unexpectedly, you know, five or six percent of, you know, GDP out of economy in one go. But I'm kind of surprised that it is not reflected 
in whatever we have heard today, at least on Ukraine, because I would assume that that somehow affects, because normally those things, they don't happen. I was, you know, involved in negotiations with both countries, and, you know, when finance ministers told that, you know, IMF team that we are going to collect 3% of GDP more next year, you know, of course the answer was forget about that. You know, those things don't happen, but they did, right? Thank you. Um, I should qualify. I, I, did, I don't know if I said it didn't matter. It, 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 it maybe wasn't addressing the question that I uh, was trying to get at. Um, I and do include in my book um, uh, taxes collected as a percentage of GDP, um, and I do trace that through. In fact, it's some of the easiest data to actually get at um, when trying to look at tax uh, collections. In terms of looking at tax compliance and trying to assess what are the intentions of the state um, as it seeks out to determine, is it a capable state? Is it capable of doing what it wants to do? How capable is the state in implementing its own tax policies? Um, uh, that, that's one figure to look at. What I find to be more persuasive is looking at what is the amount of tax arrears, taxes that the state said were out there that they didn't collect or couldn't collect as a percentage of what they did collect. Um, that's what I've been looking at. But at the same time, looking at, uh, there's no question that, that in the 2000s, all these countries began to collect more um, especially Russia and Ukraine, relative to what they have been collecting as a percentage of GDP, as the economies were uh, doing better as well. Or is it the economy of 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 the economy um, I had a question about if you I was wondering if you could talk more about age and the role that age played, um, if any, and how it differed um, for the different year. Well, first of all, what ages you looked at, and then if you asked any of the same s people over the years, um, just to kind of track them as they aged. <laughs> and yeah, some uh, some more about that I would be really interested in. Thank you. Well, to be able to have a. Um time series on the same group of people on these questions would be great. Um, it would cost me more money probably than um, <laughs> my stipend here. Um, but uh, age is deemed to matter in theories about paying taxes because it's deemed that perhaps the older people are more willing to pay. Um, but as I look across sort of the results from my surveys, in in the Russia case, age had a positive factor um, in some surveys, but didn't um, in the other in the Polish and, and Ukrainian surveys, um, which it, it, it means it's something to, to watch and to look at as to whether these socioeconomic sort of basic data have a relevance as to why some people said they more likely to obey the state or pay their taxes than others. Um, and uh, so the Russia case, you could say, upheld the theories that were drawn from American tax compliance studies, um, whereas the Polish and the Ukrainian surveys disconfirmed that. So. Yes. Salumia Spak, George Mason University. Uh, it seems to me that not only uh, attitudinal fact factors, but also constructions but, uh, of tax system but by itself plays the role in defining uh, trust and compliance uh, with taxes. Uh, recently, a working group in, at the Ministry of, uh, of Economy in Ukraine um, proposed reform, tax reform that included uh, reduction in number of taxes in Ukraine from 22 to only 8. Uh, so do we think that uh, tax system and number of taxes uh, will change uh, trust uh, among Ukrainian people and what are uh, the role of macroeconomic variables in uh, compliance and uh, trust among people in those countries? Um, 
a couple of things. There's a caveat. I'm not uh, sort of an expert on tax policy, and I, I know that in terms of, um, and this is why perhaps those who look at taxes collected as the GDP would be concerned about um, what areas of society are they going to tax and by how much and how many taxes to go out and get that revenue. Um, I tried to have a sort of, uh, um, uh, I don't have an opinion as to what the tax system structures or policies should look like. I'm just trying to figure out how well it's being implemented. That said, I can tell that um, uh, obviously Ukraine has more taxes in its tax system and its tax structure than Russia and, and Poland perhaps even combined. Um, it has a lot of taxes and they, throughout the last 20 years, they kind of New taxes always are constantly being inserted into the charts, if, if you will. Um, and undoubtedly, it would probably provide probably some sort of comfort and ease to the average taxpayer, knowing if there are only eight taxes out there rather than say 22. Um, uh, they've recently this year they've changed their tax their personal income tax from having a flat tax which is obviously very simple to remember although in my survey I asked people do you know what the f personal income tax rate is and in Russia and Ukraine they were flat taxes and for a while they were actually the same flat rate of 13 percent and far more not that many Russians knew but there were far more of them knew what their own personal income tax rate was than in, in Ukraine where it was in the, in the, in the teens, a percentage of people who knew what the tax rates were. Um, now as of J July 1st, 2014, Ukraine has changed towards a progressive tax system um, in a response to their financial crisis, which is understandable, but it complicates the tax system more and whether that will gain the trust because they are trying to have redoubled efforts in solving their financial crisis for the betterment of Ukrainian state and society or whether that will discourage people from engaging with the tax system because it's even more complicated. Um, I don't know. And the last thing is that across all of these countries, even in Poland, and I met with a lot of tax bureaucrats there, um, they all said the tax system was way too complicated, way too many rules. Um, even those who worked with the system from the inside thought it was complicated, um, the tax laws. So I, I don't know if how much simplification could be done to overcome all of that. It still it would be a long road to go from 22 to 8 may be a start, but I don't know if that would be good enough. Yeah. Hi, I'm Elspeth Southers. I'm with the NED. And I'm curious to know, did you collect any data on people's different attitudes towards paying, say, municipal or local taxes versus paying federal taxes, or did you really only look at just taxes more broadly? I only looked at taxes more broadly. Um, and I did survey, especially in 2010, um, uh, a lot of questions about one's knowledge of the tax system um, and what people, actually there's something that I did that maybe, I, I don't know if it's local versus regional, but I asked about individual taxes within um, uh, t the 2010 survey of whether people thought they were too high or too low or should be changed. And I named the taxes one by one. Um, some of them obviously are more local than, than federal in, in Russia's case. Um, but generally speaking, knowledge of the tax system was not that great in Russia and Ukraine, far less in Ukraine. Please. Um, I have a question for Jane. Uh, one of them would be if you have done any comparison between uh, small and large industries and their willingness to actually pay taxes. And uh, also, if the established um, um, tax collection practices in those three countries uh, had any impact on investment that actually came to those countries from outside. Um, I guess the short answer to both questions is no. I haven't looked at either one of them. Um, with respect to your question about looking at businesses, um, these are surveys of the general public. 
and uh, about individual attitudes. Um, I did uh, um, ask questions about whether one is likely to pay their own, uh, file their own income taxes themselves, um, and also asked questions about occupation, um, and asked questions with respect to, um, and I did a sort of a, a dummy variable, if you will, for those who were heads of organizations or upper level managers, um, which uh, one would presume along with income would determine whether they were um, from firms or not. And it didn't have any real weight in, 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 in being different from the general public's opinions on um, attitudes towards paying taxes. But BEEPS is one survey that the World Bank has been doing um, in Russia uh, with respect to businesses, uh, business and enterprise um, performance survey. Um, they don't have that many questions on taxes, um, but there's a need for, uh, which I'd love to, to do a survey of businesses as well. Let me just ask you quickly then, if you were advising uh, Mr. Poroshenko, what would you tell him? Um, I think it really is about um, opening up the state and, and to uh, try and gauge society and gain society's trust. Um, and that there is, there has been this huge deficit, probably as great a deficit as any in that part of the world, and probably far worse in recent years, um, between the, uh, how the, the trust um, across the country is not restricted to one area or the other. And um, the other thing that I think is important to people understand is for how do people, to be sort of come clean with the, the population is how they got into this mess and how they're going to get out of it. And, and that's going to involve um, people working together um, through the state and through society to do so. There's a great lack of misperceptions um, in parts of the country as to whether people are giving too much money towards the center or not. Mm -hmm. And ironically, the, those in the Dunbass region have been believing, um, rightly so, uh, that uh, uh, because they work at heavy industries that are lacking in the rest of the country, that they are actually giving funds to the center. But in many respects, if you look at the first half of 2013 um, state budget, those regions actually received more from the state than others. Um, it also involves having, you know, I think every sort of policy needs to come from the standpoint of engaging trust with society, whether that's getting television that people in the East want to watch, so they're going to be watching Ukrainian news rather than news for, that's from abroad as to what's going on, whether it's um, how social programs are handed out and, um, and what cuts are made. Um, it has to be a reorientation and thinking that the average people on the street can really feel. Any other? Is there, did you have questions, sir? No. Any other questions? It's a little hard to see here. and. Uh, if not, uh, thank you very much, Mark. That was very, very interesting and very uh, informative. Good. Good job. Very interesting.